Thank Dr. Kanuga sir for the kind invitation in NUCD. It is always a pleasure to speak at his conference. Um, the topic that I've been given to talk about is how to treat diabetes and sexual dysfunction. Now, before I start the topic or before we, uh, what I'm going to do in this topic is bring about case scenarios because we are all busy clinicians and it's always gives an important perspective when we bring cases in. But I want to say something before I started. My journey in sexual medicine has been over 15 years now. But before that, I've stood guilty of denying many patients, you know, not appropriate treatment. And if one message I could give from this meeting, from my talk, is that please do not repeat the mistakes that I have done. And hopefully that would be very clear at the end of this talk. Now, sex is a very uncomfortable situation to talk about in a clinic because the patients do not bring it up because he feels that doctor has asked about diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol, foot, eyes. If sex if diabetes is related to sex, he's going to bring it up. And in a busy clinician feels that if the patient has a problem, he's going to bring it up. So this is dichotomy often leads to sexual problems not discussed and swept under the, the carpet that is there. Now, how did the journey start? The journey started when I was doing an adolescent diabetes clinic in England. And we had a type 1 diabetic 17 year old who was not ready to, you know, comply with treatment. And, you know, I could tell him about all the complications that can happen because of diabetes. And you can see he was totally unfazed about it. And he said, I don't give a four letter word to your complication story to me. But when I said that this affects your sex life, you could see, you know, him trying to understand and trying to engage with him and he did improve his diabetes control. So it's often, you know, patients come to me and say, sir, my sexual life is very bad. I'm going to do anything at that time. You know, often it's a bargaining tool to get his diabetes under control as well. And many of them, you know, agree to the same as well. Let's bring up a scenario. Uh, a patient, 60 year old, comes to us with erectile dysfunction. He mentions he had the cheap PD5, which is quite common because pharmacy prescription is not regulated in India. And he says, total duration of sex is two minutes. What do you do? You say, Dare, sasta wala liya, thoda mehenga wala branded dete hai. You give him a longer acting PD5. You tell him you're old or none of the above. Now in medicine, I've been taught that medicine is a gray area and always even doing nothing is also an option. But let's understand to what he's trying to say. He's trying to say that he is ejaculating earlier rather than anything because you see, we have sense five sense organs. Once they're stimulated, you know, the sex center in the brain is stimulated, the sex center in the spine is stimulated, nitric oxide is released, and through the cyclic GMP pathway, there's cavernous smooth muscle relaxation, and blood flows in the penis, and you get an erection. Just balloon mein jitna hawa bharenge, utna balloon tight hoga, vaise hi, the amount of blood that comes in the penis is how tight the penis is. And PD-5 inhibitors actually act by stopping the degeneration of the cyclic GMP to GMP. So keeping this blood in the penis a little longer period of time. Let's go to another scenario. Now, Bhubaneswar has very high profile clients um, and, a, you know, a high profile client comes and says, and the distraught diabetic husband says, once he has ejaculated, it takes time for him to get an erection. He's read on the Internet that this is erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation and he wants to do help from you. So what do you do with him? Do you tell him, sugar tight karo? Do you tell him, let's have a tighter vascular control? You do nothing. You give him a branded PD-5 or you, which you should never, the last option say, you know, you try with somebody else more. They would like to hear that option, but that's not an option we should exercise. So let's understand what he's trying to say. He's trying to say, he has ejaculated and there is a lag period after which he can get an erection. Now let's look at the uh, sexual response model of Master and Johnson. If you look at the male sexual pattern, there is excitement, there is plateau, there is orgasm and then there is resolution. And between one, between one cycle to the other cycle, there is a refractory period. If you remember our 11-12 days when we used to dissect frogs or stimulate the muscle of the frog, uh, the, when we stimulate the nerve, the twitching of the muscle takes time and sometimes there's a lag before even if you're stimulating the nerve, the twitching is not happening. This is the refractory period 
and hence it is natural for a man to have a refractory period. The duration of the refractory period may vary inter-individually, but there would be a refractory period that will happen. Uh, unlike the female sexual response cycle, where the refractory period, there are multiple cycles happening at the same time. Let's look at another scenario. A Google diabetic patient who had a stent recently read that, you know, erectile dysfunction, we talked about penile attack and heart attack and says Ki if there was an erectile dysfunction and this could have been prevented, my heart attack could be prevented. He wants to come and sue his doctor now because suing is very common. And so what do you tell him? You say yes, always yes. You say always no. You get out of jail card by you know changing the topic and you say partially yes. You see, if any of us has done MCQ exams, we know that always yes is a wrong answer, always no is a wrong answer, and, if, and something or everything sometimes is always the right answer. Let's understand the reason behind this in this scenario. You see, there's a big pipe and a small pipe. Now, Montorsini has shown that, you know, if the blockade has to be 50% for the effect of the penis uh, or the blood flow to be compromised. So, if you look at the size of the artery of the penis, it's one millimeter. If you look at the size of the heart arteries, they're two to three millimeter. So, it's chota pipe or bada pipe. Pehle kachara chota pipe mein fasega. Hence, yes, theoretically, we him been an arteriopath, if we were been able to, uh, you know, change his lifestyle, stop his smoking, get his sugar under control, get his cholesterol tight, then yes, we could have perhaps prevented that. You have to very diplomatically state that in his scenario, what he's wanting to know. But in all honesty, uh, an arteriogenic ED starts from a narrower blood vessel and would go down to a bigger blood vessel that is there. When dealt with a uh, you know, patient of sexual dysfunction in the clinic, I think it's very important to understand the perspective of the patient. Why has he come now? You know, what has happened? He will say, yeah, ek saal se hai, do saal se, sir, five years se. I just recently saw a couple and I was very surprised. 60 year old couple who came to see me 20 years ago, they've been married and they've not had sex because the man is diabetic and he cannot have an erection. The reason he came today was last night, the wife threatened that she is going to go for a divorce and that has expedited the reason coming. So that the reason why it's important to know is that you will know how ready the client is ready to or the patient is ready to engage with you in the treatment, then that will determine the success of the treatment. You might have to use the local language as cruel and as rude as it sounds to understand what exactly he's trying to say that is there and have more open-ended questions that you can have. The other thing is we have to see it from his perspective. You see, we have all been born with our own ideas, our own concerns. Uh, you know, whether you like premarital sex or you feel talking about sex is a taboo, you feel is a 60 year after 60 year old sex is not important. We have our own social religious beliefs that we have been born and brought up with and that influences our own, uh, you know, approach towards sexuality. But it is important to be neutral when you are seeing the patient and look at it from his perspective and not be judgmental to his view. It's important to understand very often patients may having an, an affair on the side and guilt has prompted him to come. Something has happened to him to come. It's important to understand is there any pain or any discharge of sexually transmitted disease that are happening. It's important to understand whether this is circumstantial or situational problems in his sex life that he's okay with um, another partner. Uh, but all this while, the most important thing that you have to address that you have to address privacy. People are very worried about privacy. Um, and so you have to actually in the beginning of the consultation, be very open ended saying that whatever we talk about is going to be kept private here. You have to take a good medication history. You have to take a history of recreational drugs and obviously smoking and alcohol intake will affect his sexual life. Now, when we are sitting in a diabetes clinic, uh, I wonder sometimes what my job is. Because we can't cure diabetes and I think anybody who says he can cure diabetes, I, I, I'll have to go and learn from him as to how he does it. But my job is very clear cut. My job is to prevent micro and macro vascular complications. My job is to give him a quality of life and he should be able to achieve what he wants to achieve that his friend who is a non-diabetic can. 
and in diabetes being a chronic condition the sugar is going to wax and wane up and down so my job is to support and handheld him during this crisis times and to give him and if there is a problem of sexual dysfunction in the family it's going to cause a cold war in the house and the children can often you know feel the vibes that are there it's like the old time russia and us without being told a lot of things are told and a good happy sex life always helps to helps this feeling I'm just going to bring another case scenario because there is still a couple of minutes of my time a 30 year old diabetic who's on decently controlled 6.9 is admitted with sepsis you know when you're in the hospital you think about everything else you need to do you might think about the joint pain that you had eight months ago because you're lying on the bed and you have all the time in the earth to reflect back to your body and he tells an astute uh, intern or house officer that look i had erectile dysfunction the nice house officer goes and tests a testosterone which is low now what are you going to do about this patient <clears throat> i'm going to give him testosterone gel are you going to give him sustone injection are you going to give him three monthly injection or are you going to do nothing I think there are few factors that I want to bring out from this case scenario. Number one, never check the testosterone when it is low. Uh, sorry, never check a testosterone when the patient is unwell because sepsis will cause artificial lowering of testosterone. Number two, always check the testosterone before 11 a.m. Number three, if the testosterone is low, please repeat the testosterone because people can make a mistake. And then you're subjecting because treatment of testosterone is a lifelong. You're not doing three monthly, six monthly treatment. If a patient has got low thyroid hormones, you're going to replace him with thyroxine for the rest of his life because his body is not producing thyroxine. Similarly, if the patient is not producing testosterone, you are going to give the patient testosterone for life. So before going down the journey of testing, my you know rule of mantra is if I have to go to three, if I've decided to test the patient's testosterone, I have made a commitment that I'm going to treat the patient if it is low. No point testing the testosterone if it is low and then saying, Are, chalo, teen baat karte hai, chai baat karte hai. you have already made the patient spend 3000 rupees. You have already made a commitment to treat this patient and this commitment should be on lifelong treatment. And that should be clarified to the patient right in the beginning of it before you're going to do the testing and then only do the testing. It's important you monitor the PSA and any unexplained anemia because people talk about anemia, people talk about low hemoglobin. There's nothing called, low, you know, no reason for low hemoglobin. Testosterone deficiency can cause low hemoglobin and that can also be a flag that you can look out for patients with testosterone deficiency. Lastly, I'm just going to talk about this uh, trial which is hot of the press last year in Lancet uh, which was a testosterone for diabetes T4DM study. It was a randomized double blind placebo controlled two year phase 3B trial in Australia enrolled 1007 men and looked at whether testosterone replacement prevents progression or to reverse as early type 2 diabetes beyond the effects of community based standardized lifestyle program. And the outcome was very good over after two years. You can see testosterone plus lifestyle program, 12.4%. Placebo plus lifestyle program, 21.1%. So 41% reduction in the type 2 DEM prevalence, which is remarkable that is there. So this shows how this might improve the diabetes population. There's another study at large, which is going to come out 2022, which is a cardiovascular safety study predominantly on patients with testosterone. And that is going to end the whole controversy about the heart safety because uh, the, the, the trials which the FDA had suggested, there were flaws in the three trials which had got to that controversy. One of them had actually enrolled, had mislabeled thousand female, uh, you know, females as men and then issued an apology. So a lot of problems were there. I think this study that is going to come out and next year to West trial is going to be an excellent study to look out for early 2022 that is coming out this year. With that, I would conclude by saying what appears on the outside is not true. And just simply because of an external, we should not be biased. We should not judge the book by the cover. We should always open the book. We should always talk to the patient, understand his perspective. And I think we shall have a very satisfactory uh, clinic outcome 
for our diabetes of our patients. I find it very satisfactory when I've been able to sort out their sexual dysfunction because I find them engaging with me for their uh, diabetes far more than if I had not touched that topic. With that, I would end my uh, topic. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much.